So my first question is, how? tell me your path. How did you get into TV? You know, life is long. Maybe I'll tell the short version. <laughs> no, just, yeah, just a short one. Yeah. Uh, basically, I started working in production in New York City after um, a deviation of being uh, wanting to be a doctor and psychologist, and I decided that I wasn't good with people. <laughs> Writing. That's yes, it. Yeah. yes. Um, good with people, but not with their problems. And so I basically made my way to New York to work production and did that for a couple of years. And what was weird was um, I met these two producers uh, who actually were working at online entertainment, and they were like, what do you want to do? And this first time I said my dream out loud, I want to write, and they, no bullshit, were like, do you want to be a playwright? I said, no. And they said, what the fuck are you doing in New York City then? Go to LA. And then so it just became a thing where I was like, um, uh, yeah, I don't have a, I don't have a job there, so I can't go. And they said, we'll give you a job. And I said, then I said, um, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I have a thing going in New York City. Plus, I don't have a place to live. And they said, we'll give you a place to live. <laughs> and so when Divine Providence comes in and says, hey, get your stuff together and go to LA, I went. And it was basically, I worked for them for two years, and I had a lot of amazing people and made a lot of friends at that company. And then I realized for those two years, I worked really hard. It's a master class, but I did the one thing I was supposed to do, I didn't, I didn't write at all. I didn't write one page. And so I kind of went to Somalia to see my mom and my family the first time, and I kind of saw the, the scope of the devastation there, and I realized if I have the opportunity to live in this country and to have the gift of living my life, then I have to follow my dream or I'll be offending everyone else who kind of had a horrible life where I, where I could have. Like, I, that could have been my existence. So I came back to L.A., started writing hardcore, focused on it. I s basically got into my first writer's room as a PA. And I had, I had worked production. I had been a production coordinator. I'd done all this stuff, and they said, do you want to be a PA? And I said, of course, because I knew that the only way I could get in, the one, of the, one of the many ways was to start over. So I became a PA, I made my way through, I learned how to be a script coordinator, did that on The Killing, and then through the writers of The Killing, they helped me with my applications, and I basically got into the ABC writing program, and that helped me with my first staff job in 2014. And uh, <coughs> the one thing I'll say is that after the staff job, I was like, yes, I made it, yeah, it's so amazing. And Boxy was there with me, and Mickey was there with me, and, Greg and Tim, they were all supportive. And then the one thing I didn't expect to happen was the drought. You get your first job and you think, I've made it, but really I had to keep working and I had to keep writing. So I spent two years, I worked on a web series, and then finally I got into um, the DC camp on Legends of Tomorrow. But what was really a beautiful thing was the community aspect of it. My, um, the friend I made all those years ago on, uh, at Odd Lot, basically was an uh, intern there, and then she became a PA, and then she basically started making her way through. She's an EP on Legend, and they said, well, we want this type of writer. She said, I know a type of writer. So my relationship from, what, 14 years ago, basically well, got me to this place. So it was just, it was a gift in a way, and I kind of can't imagine where my life would be without like making the community that I have now, with the friends I have now, because that's why I'm here, and it's basically, my story is not my story, it's a story of all the relationships and friends I have along the way. Yeah, yes, but. Yes, but. You, you did work your ass off in the meantime. It wasn't like you sat around uh, eating uh, jelly beans and being like waiting for your friends to give you a job. They were jelly beans. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of you know what I mean? You, like you need, you need both. I, I, obviously, I'm a big believer in community, and, yeah. and I absolutely, but if you're still not doing the work, mm -hmm. your friends can only give you so much. Mm -hmm. And if you're like, oh yeah, script, you should have written one of those. Yeah. Um, you know, so I'm, I'm saying this not to dispute the power of community, I'm saying that you're underselling your own uh, achievements or what you, you know, how hard you worked to yeah. work, work on being a writer. It's a true, I mean, but like we are self-deprecating individuals, like, you know, yes. usually unless you have a big ego, which some of us do, some of us don't. But like, yeah, I, I worked, I wrote, I wrote, um, <laughs> there was a time where I basically they were like, hey, are we giving a writer's assistant a job? And uh, as a script, uh, we're giving him a script this episode, so can you do his job and your job? So I was at the office until like, you know, two in the morning writing the notes, and then after that, I would sometimes spend the night there and start working on my script, and then I would go home for five minutes, change, shower, and then come back in, and they didn't know. But that, like, there were many days where I worked hard hours and long, long periods of like, just do the script, stay up for a couple hours, go back home, come back, and then when I would crash on the weekends. And like, you know, the thing is like sometimes the belief is that the hard work stops after you've made it and made it is subjected to everyone here. So like you don't know what your barrier is, but when you think this is your line, it's not your line, the line. And then you get to your line and then again, it's not your line. Every time you keep progressing and growing as a writer, you keep pushing harder and harder. There's some people who, you know, you know, like don't want to do the work and that's when you become a producer. <laughs> 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 but we're not.
not gifted in that space. We, we do the hard work and we all work hard. And I think that's a given for most of us who make it. What's it like being a woman of color? Any, did you notice any differences? Uh, cha extra challenges, less challenges? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a challenge. I mean, let's put it this way. You walk into a room and no one looks like you. So you automatically feel awkward. <laughs> you can't be yourself. You have to figure out if, you know, you say something a little too passionately, they're like, you're a little aggressive. And I'm kind of like, I have a uh, sense of demeanor anyway, so I don't come off threatening to a lot of people. But you know, sometimes I get the New York comes out in me. <laughs> I get a little passionate. And sometimes people are like, whoa, whoa, why are you so angry? And I'm just saying, I'm not angry. I'm just showing you the full side of me. And sometimes I realize I have to not be that person. That's in some places, it's not everywhere. And so, you know, it, it is a thing it's like but the thing is it's like asking someone what it is to you know be colorblind it's just a part of your existence and after a certain point you accept it and then if you don't you spend a lot of time fixating on it and then you start having a chip on your shoulder and then people start seeing that chip and then you start people like don't like you and you don't why do they like me so it becomes this self-fulfilling cycle uh, you basically can't move forward you can't grow because you kind of like focus on the one thing that you think is a detriment but if you can pivot and say it's a gift it's a different conversation. Are you noticing a shift lately? I think uh, I'm noticing a shift with community. Like I realized a lot of times I used to think I was the only one in the room, but I've made so many friends who look like me and other people from different cultures and different spaces. And I've, and it's expanding in such a way, like I came up in production in New York City where I was the only one out of 400 people. And, you know, New York City, guys, <laughs> so, the melting pot of America. And there was one of me and no one else. And it just became a it became a thing where I was like, oh, I came to Hollywood and I for a while I thought I was the only one. And then I realized, no, there's hundreds of us. We're just hiding. We're like we're like little pieces of spices. And you're like, you know, like your pasta, like, you know, we, we are there, but you don't taste it. You just say this pasta is amazing. I don't know what's so great about this pasta. <laughs> My old pasta doesn't taste that great. This is amazing. So yeah, that's the thing. Like I think the change is that we are everywhere and it's not as highlighted, but then the other, the flip side is because there's so many of us, people feel threatened. And it's not a threatening thing. It's great food, great conversation, great personality, great people. Yeah. Um, tell me about the drought. LA drought? You no, know, yeah, not, not, I mean your personal drought. What, what's that feel like? Like you had some, you know, you had some success, and then what sort of a drought? What did the drought look like? Hmm. Well, the drought looked like, oh, I got staffed. I was on the show with the great people, and then I did six months on it, and then staffing season. Okay, so network television, there's this uh, prime time where it's around April to end of May that you can try to get a job. You'll do a bunch of meetings between November and April, but the chunk of it is ac actually during um, upfront where they start premiering. Today, you know, we are showing the shows on fall for ABC, Alias, you know, whatever. So once you start hearing about what shows get picked up, that's the time you want to find a job. And so that time came and went and not a phone call. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> so that was like, oh, cable. And then I realized the one thing I, I can say about the drought is that it's partly my fault in a way. When you think you've made it, sometimes you don't effort as much as you used to. Like I used to hustle, like I would go to meetings, I would network. And just at my personality, I like people anyways, but like, you know... But you're not good with them. No, I'm not good with their problems. Oh, I can tell <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but, you know, I liked hanging out, but then when I was focusing on writing as much, the, the other thing they don't tell you about this industry is you have to be social. Because if people don't know you're out there, then how can you get a job? Mm. And so I stopped doing the work. And that's why I was like, I rested. And I was like, oh, I don't have to go to this meeting. I don't have to go to this mixer. I have agents, I staffed, I've made it. I can, you know, write another script and that's it. And I was wrong. You can't stop working. So how long did it take you to figure that out? <laughs> yeah. um, so I staffed in 2014, did two sh episodes, and then 2015 went by, 2016 went by, and I staffed in 2017. I did a web series in between it, and I was like the lead writer, and I got to hire my friends, which was a gift. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. I get to work with my friends. But um, it wasn't what I want. It wasn't network television. It wasn't like the big show. Right. And it took two and a half years, and I had to get rid of agents. I had to like, you know, be aggressive, which is not necessarily my nature. Like, you know, to be the, to be your own boss and to be the boss is the energy you kind of have to persist with or kind of step into because. No one's going to care more about your, your job and your, your employment than you. 
And if you wait for the agents to get you the meetings, if you wait for everyone to basically bring it to you, then you're not going to, some people, most people, won't get work. So what, um, I don't know, I don't know how, how I feel right now. Um, so what, um, so what, what advice do you have for people who are not yet at the agent and staffing and, you know, they're, they're still on the outside looking in um, I, nowadays with what you're seeing? Nowadays. A um, couple big pieces, community, networking, those are the things I've already said, but the other big pieces, you know, a lot of us, and me included, like, well, I'll watch a TV show and I'll be focused on plot. I love plot. I love burning through it. It's something I enjoy so much. I get fixated on it. And I love shows that basically have twists and turns. And, but a lot of times when people are reading stuff, they want to know the emotional journey of a character. They want to know why I'm opening this script. And if you don't hook them in the first 10 pages of what the show is with the plot and the character journey, you lose them. And I used to read scripts and I didn't realize why I would stop reading. Because, you know, I'm like, here, I want the explosion. I want the fugitive. I want the man with the no arm fighting him and going down the stairs. <laughs> But what was his what was his pain, what was his suffering, what was his want, what was his need? He wanted to find out who killed his wife. The obstacle was he was in jail. And he, you know, like so to me, like when if you can meld the two together, you make magic. That's my kind of story sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well I, I read a lot of scripts from, you know, people entering the competitions, mm -hmm. the various competitions. And yeah, that's that's why we run by the way, I run a workshop, if you're new to this, on in August is our next one, where we work on emotional development mm -hmm. and characters because <clears throat> uh, I've said this before, but I'll say it again. The like Titanic would not have been a, a movie. It was not just a cool movie about a boat no. sinking. That's not why millions of teenage girls went to go and see it. Because it was because they fell in love with Jack and Rose. Yeah. And a mediocre script. But they. Uh, yeah. uh, but they. But is they this, did. This, you yeah, this is on oh, your, okay, I, okay, I, cool. I, I think I don't think James Cameron's going to come after me. I think I'm okay. But I'll, let, I'll tell you what. If I have a meeting, he's like, I'm not hiring you. Then it'll be. I'll be like, Damn it. Um, but. Uh, yeah, but it's the it's the um, if you think about it, um, every great story is since the history of stories, we've cared about the people in them, always in them, not just story, not just plot. I mean, it's it, it, it will die. Your 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 best story ever will die if we don't give a shit about the people going through. Hundred percent. And I didn't realize that going in. Most writers don't, especially with the obsession with story. I mean, yeah. I, you know, Robert McKee kind of took over for a while, and we got into charts and graphs, and, which are all great. You yes. know, structure is important, but please don't lose sight of the people in it and yeah. give us the opportunities to know how they're feeling when they're when you're doing things to them. And then you have to be an asshole and put the obstacle right in front of what they want. Yeah. And then keep doing it. Yeah. All the way through. Being an asshole is tough. I know, it's so mean. How? What? <laughs> and then just briefly, what, what's the writer's room like on Legends of Tomorrow? What's, what's uh, that like doing a superhero-y type? It's, we're, we're a kind of a different type of show. Yeah. I mean, everyone in the Berlantiverse is a family. And like I like visiting the family members. I go to different houses and I'm like, hey, how are you doing? But the funny thing about us is we actually like each other, hang out with each other a lot. And so we, we've gone on trips together. We've gone to shows together. We have group texts. It's just like a family unit. And so like when you're with your family all the time, you kind of go, I feel kind of spoiled and I don't want it to end. So can I just stay here? But then, you know, life cycles of shows change and whatnot. And it's just a group dynamic. We laugh all the time. The one thing you'll hear from all the other shows, they go work next to the bathrooms and they say, every time I walk by, your room is laughing. Mm -hmm. We laugh all day long. It is, and if we, <laughs> if you hear a, a specifically loud group set of laughter, then you'll, and it, you'll just know that basically we're all talking, we can't do this, right? This is too crazy, right? We can't do this. And then 10 minutes later, we're all laughing again because we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the type of show we're on. It's really lighthearted and just a, a good group of people. One, one thing I've heard, and Boxy was one of them who sat here and said it too, when he first got into Silicon Valley and even Lloyd, another, mm -hmm. another writer we know, um, and Mickey may speak to this too, that, that the junior writers coming in have to kind of be the quiet person in the room. Like you yes. can't be too opinionated or too strong-willed or, I mean, is that, that's... Every show is different. That's the other thing that you kind of have to figure out. Like, so because, sorry, I don't want you to interrupt because, yeah. but because when we're on the outside, yeah. it's like you must have your unique voice, no. and you must be, and this must be, so they can see that you're different. And then you get into the room, it's like, don't do any of that. <laughs> Is that how it sort of essentially goes down? Well, that's the thing, though. Like every, that's what I was trying to get to that sorry, place. Yeah. No, 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 no. I cut you off. I didn't realize. Uh, every room has a different type of um, chemistry and alchemy to it, and the best piece of advice I can give you is to sit there and just listen. No one's waiting for your pitch. 
if you're a newer writer, unless you're an EP and you, they're really waiting for your pitch, they're paying you for it. But if you're a new writer in a room, listen. And the other thing you're gonna have to learn is that there are 10 people talking at the same time. You're gonna have to track what they're saying, follow their journey, and then also at the same time come up with your own pitch. And so for the first couple of weeks, your brain is like, you'll sleep, go to bed, and you'll hear their voices because your brain's not used to hearing that much noise all at once for 10 hours a day. And so, you know, Everyone's like, yeah, pitch your unique voice, pitch your specific journey, like pitch this. Great. For the first couple of weeks, listen, absorb, watch how people pitch, watch and listen how other pitches land. Like see who's the one and see what everyone has. Everyone in the room usually has a role. Some people are like the emotional journey characters. Who, like they follow, they follow specific characters, they follow specific journeys. Some people are called, like we call them assassins. They do one pitch and they literally knock it out of the park and they go away. You know, it's just like everyone has a role. And so you can also figure out what your role can be, but it's also um, uh, like every room is different. And some rooms, it, some rooms can tell you beat by beat how they want you to write the story and you can't deviate. Other shows write a line for the episodes they could go with God. So you really just need to like, you can't assume all shows, you can't put like one kind of color palette to one every show on the universe because every show is run by a different person and every person is different. Right. So just the, my biggest piece of advice is just sit there and listen as much as you can and absorb, absorb as much as you can because as a staff writer or a newer writer, they're not expecting that much from you. So, you know, they can always think you're the strong silent type who's so wise. <laughs> <laughs> People have assumptions about you when you're kind of the quiet one and then you start realizing the the tempo of the room and then you can talk. But once you start talking and you're, you don't have the tempo, then you're kind of like the, um, have you ever done rowing? And you, uh, you're you all moving at the same time, but the one person who catches a crap throws the entire ship off. Mm -hmm. And you know they start, then you start seeing people fall into the water, like literally catching oars and falling into the water. You can be the crap. <laughs> and you can get people to like top, topple over just by coming in off rhythm. And it, it's a skill that takes time. You know, you can really be, you, and the other thing you can learn about yourself is there are writers who are great in the page, there are writers who are great on set, there are writers who are great in the room. Usually you can get two out of three, rarely can you get three out of three. So once you figure out who you are in the room, that's also your superpower. Are you doing any writing? Yes. I mean, like, away from the show, your own yes. writing? Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm basically um, working on pilots and, you know, features just because I want, like, I was pitching before Boxy passed, I was pitching him a horror comedy, and I was like, this is the perfect person to pitch a horror comedy to. And he was looking at me, he says, you know, someone has to die in this story, right? <laughs> and I was just sitting there, and like, you know, for me, like, you know, working on these projects and working on this, um, on this comedy thing, like, it just made me realize, even as established as I am in my career, as like, you guys are moving forward in yours, I still miss things. And it's great to talk to your friends about it. And I'm glad I got the opportunity to talk t to him. I'm glad I got to talk here with you guys. It's so cool. It's really how, so how do you fit it into your week? Like you work 10 uh, hours a day and then you go home and I mean, how do you fit? Weekends. Weekends? Weekends are very helpful. Okay. Also, um, you know, sometimes uh, at lunch I'll disappear and I'll start doing a mini beat sheet on um, a piece of paper. Just so like, you know, I'll have ideas and I'll just write it down really quickly so that on weekends I can really look at it. Um, if I'm feeling really, you know, spry, I'll wake up at five in the morning and go, I'm gonna do pages and then just start <laughs> typing. Uh, and then I read it and, and, and like at, after work, I'm like, oh, this is shit. <laughs> <laughs> So weekends have been my sweet spot. Right. All right. Do we have anybody have any questions for him? I did. Yeah. Um, like I, I've been, I've been submitting a lot, and I've been also thinking about like I've kind of found out like what uh, uh, writing packets are starting to look like. But my question is, is uh, how important is our, our spec scripts? Like, should I just start writing like spec scripts from like different networks just to have like, spec not? pilots? Or yes, spec pilots. You sorry. mean for existing shows or for original? Yeah, shows? For existing uh, Oh, like, I just have those like under my belt just in case I need to like, uh, I just want to know how important those are. I mean, the global answer is most, right now, showrunners are saying, no, I don't need a spec pilot of an existing show, mm -hmm. or expect script of an existing show, they don't need that. But you will find the one outlier who will be like, does he have a spec? Right. <laughs> and, then, and then you go, uh, no, and then like, well, I just really need to know if he can capture a voice. So like if it's a show I know, then I can basically say, or if I read it and I can say, oh, this is something I understand or get. I have one, it's dated, but like I know that basically um, the lucky thing I have is working on a show where 
it, I, they can see my scripts from the show, and it's an existing show, so they can see that I capture the voice of the show. So it's like it's really about like you know you'll always find an outlier, you always find that person who wants it. Like I know like three showrunners off the top of my head who would want it, so um, I would have it. I would just have one, and then like you can let, make that last for a couple of years. There's some people who still have Deadwoods from Dead, when Deadwood was on the air, and now it's a movie. So now you're like yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. cycle it. <laughs> Very, I think it's important. Yeah. It, it's a, a great exercise for you because if you can write an evergreen episode of a show, that means you can probably pop into a room and be able to just like write their show. If you right. can figure out what your um, ways of learning how to get the voice of a show, that will help you when you get your own staffing. Yeah. The other thing you might do too is that uh, um, I'm not a big fan. I, I've never, oh, yeah. I never like them for me. But uh, it does help you with structure too. It does force you to look at how a show, you know, how many scenes they have, what, what they do for the act break, you know, uh, you know, all of that sort of stuff, which if you're making one up on your own, you never get around to actually learning properly because you get lost in your own so true. magic, which is why I don't like to write it because I like my own magic. <coughs> uh, anyone else have any questions? Mickey Fisher. When you were doing, uh, uh, coming back here to work at the uh, company and you used to, coming back from Somalia and you really started writing. How did you approach the material, the stories that you wanted to tell? Like, what, what, what was your angle coming into it? Was there a certain genre that you loved more than others? Did you pick a lane and go for it? Uh, I, you know, I love sci-fi genre, horror. Like, I love kind of like the fantasy element in that world. But what I started to kind of realize was, and this is my own thing. I'm, I realized when I came back, I was already putting elements of my own upbringing into my stories. Like I wanted with the scripts, which uh, Tim and uh, Mickey and Greg all heard was like about gin and how I had heard a story as a kid and it was the Arab version of it and it's not genies, it's gin. And so I was working on that for a while and that was from my upbringing. I had never really heard that story anywhere else. And I, so I had already been implementing elements of myself into those stories in the world. And what I realized when I came back was I was doing more of it. And so I would always have like, and people say write what you know, but that's not necessarily true because writers were creative. We can write more than that. We can see different things, but it does help to ground you in like um, people that you know or characters you know because you can start there and you can change it. But it does help you kind of like this. Um, the fundamentals will help you a lot when you do that. And it's, I was I always put myself or my upbringing into my work. I just didn't realize it until then. Anything else? Anyone? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I guess it, as you're building a script and writing your head, you can spend unlimited time and really tweak it. So how did you transition to being in a writer's room where it's like, yeah, so it's got to go out. Like, how did you transition to writing for deadline? There's something called the production shark. And if you keep tweaking and being a perfectionist, which I have a tendency to do, it will eat you. <laughs> <laughs> Production, there's prep, and then you need a script like two to three days at least before prep starts, so the director can at least have some time. And then once the production shark starts showing up at your door on the like the last couple of episodes, you start realizing, oh wait, it's two to three days before we start shooting, and we still we don't have a final script. And then all of a sudden, then the the story locations can't get locked down. You know, props aren't ready. You you really have to be on time. You know, and the WGA always hones us in quality scripts on time. That's your job as a writer, as a showrunner. And if you can't do that, then television may not be the space you need to be in because it will, it can stress people out and it can break you down. And it's a good skill to learn how to do it even though you have to let go of some of the precious things you want to have. You just have to. And it's television. You can always rewrite another version. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, do you have any? Oh, I'll have the last one. So I'm actually knowledgeable about, about writing rooms and stuff. So I was wondering, like, whenever you're ready to write a script, how long do you usually have to write, a, write an episode before you have to turn it in? Uh, also, just like, how does the like drafting and feedback process work on a show? Yeah. Um, Every show is different. Um, some feedback you get specifically from the showrunner. Some rooms do this terrifying thing where they all read it out loud in front of you. <laughs> um, some people will yeah, exactly. Uh, some people will note you. They'll send you pages of notes from different writers. Other, but a lot of shows will just do it straight from the showrunner and maybe the higher levels, and they'll give you notes. Uh, sit down with you and give you notes. Or some shows won't even give you anything, and they'll basically rewrite you. And you have to do all of that with grace <laughs> and a smile. Uh, and so, how long do you get? Uh, well, usually it's supposed to be like maybe four days if you're lucky, four to five days for an outline, and really lucky two weeks, to ten days. And maybe if you're amazingly lucky, you can get weekends in there. 
um, because then you can get like 14 days and you're like, yes, I'm in the sweet spot. But um, sometimes you, I've had to turn in a script in two days. And, and the outline had always been changing at that point. So I didn't even know what the story was when I started writing. And so that's a, uh, an exercise in madness, but you still have to keep going. And so, um, and so the, the, qual the hope is four to five days for an outline, and that's generous, because it's usually 10 pages, 20 pages. You could sit, that, you could sit down and do that in a couple of days. Um, and then uh, two weeks for a script. But every show is different, every monster is different. All right. Um, just before we wrap up, um, any final advice you have for uh, an aspiring writer? Um, it's a long journey. Drink heavily. <laughs> <laughs> and um, keep your friends close, because uh, there's no guarantee of where you'll end up, but at least if you have them, you won't be lonely and old. <laughs> yeah. Well, you'll be old. Yeah, well, you that's know what I mean, but you'll get hard. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Very yeah. much. Thank you.